Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Brave New World series of IBTTA webinars. I'm Pat Jones, the Executive Director and CEO of IBTTA. First off, a big shout out to IBTTA President Samuel Johnson. On Tuesday, he received the Contagious Leadership Award from the IBTTA Leadership Academy Alumni Association. Samuel is the first graduate of the IBTTA Leadership Academy to become president of IBTTA. In receiving the award, Samuel said, it's an honor to be recognized as an inspirational leader by my industry peers around the globe. At a time when we are all worried about the health, the economy, and social injustice, we shouldn't shy away from leadership as challenging as it may be. He added, I firmly believe that thought leadership in transportation and infrastructure investment can help a pandemic influenced economy start to recover and our industry is ready to lead the charge. Once again, congratulations Samuel on receiving the Contagious Leadership Award. You are the right man to lead IBTTA in these challenging times. Now, on to today's program. In the Brave New World series of webinars, we strive to present experts, scholars, writers, and practitioners whose experiences lie outside the realm of the tolling industry. This week, we're extremely pleased to bring you Peter Norton, Associate Professor of History in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia. Peter is the author of Fighting Traffic, the Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City. His article, Street Rivals, Jaywalking and the Invention of the Motor Age Street, won the Abbott Payson Usher Prize from the Society for the History of Technology. Peter has published works on transportation history and policy, traffic safety, and autonomous vehicles. In recent years, Peter has been a regular instructor for the IBTTA Leadership Academy. And last year, he was a keynote speaker at our Technology Summit in Orlando. Well, what about today's presentation? We live in a world in which the reputation of individuals, major institutions, and even countries are on the line, and where the choices we make about how to treat our fellow human beings have huge consequences. From the health and societal effects of COVID-19 to the worldwide demonstrations against racial injustice, the values of society are changing before our eyes. The transportation landscape and the people who are helped or harmed by it are influenced by the choices we make. Using examples from literature and popular culture, Professor Peter Norton invites us to embrace a new perspective about the role of transportation in the world. He also asks us to see that communities which have previously been excluded need to be included. I know you'll find Peter's presentation to be challenging and thought provoking. We encourage you to actively engage with Peter and his presentation. He's gonna speak for about 40 minutes. Please use the chat function on your screen to post a comment or question at any time. We will monitor your questions and pose them to Peter when he finishes his presentation. Now it's time to lean in and engage with Professor Peter Norton. Peter, you have the floor. Okay, uh, is, is this my screen now? Yes. Okay. Uh, First of all, I want to apologize. Peter, you're not sharing. I'm sorry, you're not sharing. Okay. I think I'm sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to apologize to the, the audience. You've been very patient with my technical problems on my end. I want to assure you that the uh, people at IBTTA have been amazing in helping me with this unexpected glitch. Um, thank you for your patience with that and thank you for your introduction, Pat. I want to start by inviting you to type in to uh, your um, chat box your 
answer to this question. Um, it may not seem obvious why I'm asking, but I think it will be, I'll, I'll make it obvious soon. And with that, I'd like to begin by suggesting to you that you have a situation now in the tolling business that I think is a lot like the situation broadcasters faced a generation or two ago. It may not be clear why that is, but I think you can learn from this example. And I think it's actually an example where you could do better than this other interest group, the National Association of Broadcasters did about 50 or 60 years ago. So I was, I'm gonna predict, and I'll be interested to see what the actual result is. I'm gonna predict that the most common answer to my question was uh, the amazing television series, Sesame Street, which was launched in November, 1969 which has had amazing educational and social benefits. These happened not because of the National Association of Broadcasters, but despite the National Association of Broadcasters. My challenge to you is what opportunity to, does the tolling business face where instead of missing the bus, like the NAB did a generation or two ago, IBTTA and the tolling businesses can catch the bus, so to speak, and not miss out on this opportunity because the success of Sesame Street is a profound reputational benefit to broadcasters, but that happened despite the National Association of Broadcasters, not because of them. So I wanna ask you, what can you offer that the National Association of Broadcasters was in a position to offer, uh, but failed to? I don't have to, I'm gonna mute my phone, excuse me. I don't have to uh, prove that this show is the great success that it is, although it's useful to note. So my question for you is what does IBTTA have to offer like this? That uh, the series Sesame Street has its own web page, its own Wikipedia page, specifically just for its accolades, which include 228 Emmy Awards. It's not a huge moneymaker, but it's an amazing reputational benefit to television and it came at a time when television desperately needed that reputational benefit. Incidentally, it's also a time that was very much like our time, a time of polarization, a time of social change, a time of anxiety, a time of instability. Well, we're in such a time again, and we can learn from this past occasion when we were facing such uh, challenges as well. So my talk today is, can you, help us get to Sesame Street. Um, broadcasters have gotten us started. I think other enterprises, including tolling, can help as well. If it's not clear why that's the case, uh, I'm gonna try to offer you some suggestions now. I wanna start with an example from a children's story. It's a children's story I think people in the tolling business should be especially alert to. It's also a children's story that packages grown-up wisdom I mean, really timeless sage wisdom within the humble bounds of a children's chapter book. In, if you have read The Phantom Tollbooth, you will recognize Milo and his situation. At the beginning of the book by Norton Juster, 1961, illustrated as you see here by Jules Pfeiffer, Milo is discouraged, he's depressed, he has no sense of purpose. He goes home and he finds the most amazing thing ever, which is in fact a toll booth. He opens it up, he assembles it. It comes with some signs, which you can see in Jules Pfeiffer's illustration. And the text makes clear what the signs say. And so Milo slows down, has his fare ready and has to think about what his destination is. And at this stage, he really doesn't know what his destination is. And I think the book is, is a, um, a reminder of how important it is to have a clear destination in mind. He enters this amazing world through this phantom magic toll booth, but he immediately takes a wrong turn, which is very much like what many of us have done, including me in difficult moments of life. And he ends up stuck here in the doldrums, as you can see, going a long distance, but also going nowhere at all. And 
uh, he finds on his way a helper, and the helper takes the form of a, of a dog who's called the watchdog. He has a watch as part of his body. And the uh, dog advises Milo about how he got stuck. And Milo discovers it's because he wasn't thinking. The dog recognizes this, says, yes, you're quite right. But uh, Milo still doesn't know quite how to get out of this situation. The answer, of course, is that if you got into a jam by not thinking, you have to get out of it by thinking. But there's this very certain specific kind of thought that the author, Norton Juster, is recommending. It's not just mathematical thought, although it includes that. It's not just verbal thought, although it includes that as well. He says you need to have a balance of both. However, in this land, which in the story is called the lands beyond, these two ways of thinking are divided. The people who think in words, the people who think imaginatively, artistically, are in Dictionopolis. The people who think in numbers are away in Digitopolis. And these two worlds don't communicate. And this is the basis of all the problems in this land. It was formerly the land of wisdom, but now it's been divided. And so Milo's mission becomes to reunite these two ways of thinking. Uh, so the first uh, word of advice I have for you derived from this book is that data don't drive. This is not me talking. This is Norton Juster, the author of the Phantom Toll Booth. Mathematics, data, quantitative thinking are essential, but by themselves, all alone, they don't actually solve problems. We need to have data and we need to know our purpose. Data are like compass readings. They tell us where we're going, but they don't tell us what our destination is. And I think one of the reasons why business enterprises end up in the doldrums is that there's a notion right now that data drive everything. This is the notion that the math magician, who's the king of Digitopolis, has in the phantom toll booth. But we have it all around us as well. You'll find that apparently if you want to sell a business advice book, include data-driven in the title, because all of these books include data-driven in the title. And apparently the data indicate that if you want your book to sell, include data-driven in the title, which might be useful advice if you're wanting to write a book. I don't know how useful it is if you want to run a successful enterprise. This is not a new idea. It's always presented as if it's new, but it goes back <clears throat> well over 100 years. Uh, to Frederick Winslow Taylor, who in 1911 basically said data drives successful management. And in this book, The Principles of Scientific Management, 1911, he advised people to measure everything, time and the motion of workers. And this is the way you will uh, sort of maximize your business's productivity. People have forgotten principles of scientific management. Nobody reads it anymore because actually it was a bit of a dead end. It's generally recognized now as a failed effort to turn management into a pure quantitative science. And yet, although we recognize now that this book is not the key to success in business, we still are haunted by the same idea. The idea that we will standardize, tabulate, accept, and use all of these quantitative techniques to purify and perfect management. All of these techniques are necessary, none are sufficient. They give us the assembly line, they give us mass production, but they don't give us the creativity that was the key to General Motors passing, you see here the Ford Model T assembly line in the 1920s. But they, according to Norton Juster's account in the Phantom Toll Booth, went to the opposite extreme. They went into pure verbal, constructions, imagination untethered from reality. In other words, they dwelled in Dictionopolis, which was run by King Azaz, the unabridged, the king of this land where there are words unguided by digital data. I think the King Azaz of the real world, just as we had a real world math magician in the form of Frederick Winslow Taylor, we had a real world King Azaz of Dictionopolis in the, in the form of Charles Kettering of General Motors. Charles Kettering was all about creating fantasies. 
keep the consumer dissatisfied. If you constantly present an unachievable but very attractive fantasy, your customers will keep buying in the hope of someday arriving there. If everyone were satisfied, he said, no one would buy the new thing. So this is a way of selling products, right? This is, this is how you do it in the land of Dictionopolis, in the land of words and imagination unguided by data, where we see, for example, promises like the foolproof highway of the future, where we will have 98% fewer fatalities, where you'll be able to drive 50 miles an hour without traffic lights and no parking problems. These are all directly connected to General Motors' effort to stir the imagination. That included also their founding of the National Highway Users Conference in the same year that the American Toll Bridge Association was founded, that's IBTTA's predecessor, in the depths of the Depression. In 1932, uh, General Motors and the American Automobile Association founded the National Highway Users Conference, promising that you could have not only toll-free roads, but what they liked to call free roads, no charge whatsoever. They managed to get Congress um, to, to uh, consider this question of toll roads versus free roads, and they ended up condemning toll roads for all except a few specialized places like the Pennsylvania Turnpike, the Merritt Parkway in Connecticut, bridges and tunnels, but not uh, for the rest of the country. Instead, we had the gasoline tax to fund most of these roads, and these were presented to the American people imaginatively in, in words as free roads, right? AAA joined in behind this. Uh, National Highway Users Conference called toll roads epidemics, a metaphor with particular resonance right now. Uh, the National Highway Users Conference promised that freedom and free roads and political liberty and uh, human rights are all of a piece. They freely mixed as, as the uh, king of Digitopolis would have welcomed this use of freedom, both to mean cost-free, as if roads could ever be free, but also politically free in ways that resonated with uh, traditional American values, right? They would have us, this is straight from the National Highway Users Conference. They said, roads, they shall be forever free. This is what the Minutemen at Lexington and Concord fought for, right? The, the message from General Motors was align the future you want, a future of driving on toll-free roads with a past that you, your audience values. Right, and this is still with us today. The Alliance for Toll-Free Interstates still stands for this now, and they still use this powerful word, again, in a way Norton Juster, the author of Phantom Tollbooth, was warning about, uh, in a way that's deliberately manipulative of its audience, right? Free to drive, right? As if these roads could ever be free. General Motors really reached the, the uh, ultimate with this technique and promising new horizons of ever better futures. They did this at, uh, most famously at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City, where millions of people saw the free exhibit of a future depicted in a giant model showing no traffic lights, no parking problems, no delay, never driving less than 50 miles an hour, and also uh, never paying a toll. This was all part of the fantasy and um, because it was a fantasy unconnected with mathematical reality, it was as dangerous as uh, you know, the, the uh, obsession with data-driven. This was a kind of yellow brick road that came out the same year as the Oz movie, 1939, A Promise of a Blissful Future. What uh, L. Frank Baum, the author of, of uh, Wizard of Oz, called the Emerald City, uh, Norton Juster in the Phantom Tollbooth, calls a castle in the air. A castle in the air is a place that can't really be and that will lead you astray if you always seek for it. The solution is to restore rhyme and reason, according to the Phantom Tollbooth. Rhyme meaning imagination and reason meaning quantitative reality. They have to go together, is what the book is advising in uh, the Phantom Tollbooth. Let these castles in the air go. That's the advice. Uh, in the book. He calls these castles in the air nothing but a prison, 
And I don't think that's an overstatement when you look at the effect of pursuing the zero congestion, zero toll uh, future that was being presented so imaginatively. This is the imagined future. The reality looked more like this. On, on the left, you see General Motors 1939 model of the future. On the right, you see Portland, Oregon, as it actually looked in the year that this model was purporting to depict, that is 1960. If you have, in effect, subsidized driving because people pay no tolls, then you end up, of course, stimulating the amount of car use in such a way that you gradually erase the city. Other companies as well, it wasn't just General Motors, were depicting this kind of congestion-free fantasy. Uh, so was the Portland Cement Association in, in this ad for the Northwest Expressway, what we now call the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago, which they said they could make congestion-free so that you'd have many extra hours for your pleasure thanks to uh, this congestion-free highway. That justified building this extraordinary project, which was justified incidentally on grounds of slum clearance, that is residents were moved out to make room for this. And instead of giving you this congestion-free highway which was promised, they gave us the most congested artery in the USA. You see that number one, that's according to the American Highway Users Alliance. They say this is the most congested highway in the USA. And these are the same people who said that we should have toll-free highways everywhere, right? And rather elementary economics, that if you uh, subsidize demand, you end up with a shortage of supply. And that's what, as you know, congestion is. The social effects of this were very painful for many people as well. This justified doing things like um, removing uh, so-called substandard areas to make way for expressways, which of course took the form of urban renewal. On the right, you see an attack on urban renewal from the Baltimore Afro-American, because in effect it tended to mean removing black people for the sake of uh, suburban commuters, right? You can see that graphically here in Detroit. This is African-American Detroit in 1959. And this is the same view two years later after the Chrysler Freeway was put in. This is before it opened up for traffic. Uh, if you see these pictures side by side, you can see it's the same view. In effect, African-American Detroit, or the heart of it, was erased for the sake of this fantasy, this castle in the air, as Norton Justa would call, would call it. To store all these cars in the middle of Detroit, you had to practically erase the center of Detroit and turn it into car storage. So according to Norton Juster in the Phantom Toll Booth, if you're constantly pursuing this one measured reality, in this case speed, you will gradually erase everything else of value, right? Yes, speed has value, but so do other things too, like neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and uh, quite vividly in the Phantom Toll Booth, uh, Norton Juster just describes this erasure of the city for the sake of this one thing moving fast at low cost. Uh, to make it concrete again, this is uh, Bureau of Public Roads plan for Minneapolis and St. Paul. That's the site where George Floyd was killed. I don't think it's coincidental that we have seen some of the worst racial injustices around the sites of these um, projects. Uh, St. Paul, just to the east of Minneapolis, this was the circled area. It was the heart of African-American St. Paul. As you can see, I-94 was planned to go a little bit north of it. In fact, in practice, it ended up going right through the middle of it, right? So that northern route, which you saw in the previous map, was simply too expensive and the people who lived there were too politically connected, such that African-American St. Paul was almost erased for the sake of Interstate 94. This is Rondo Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1940. Here it is in 1968. It's approximately the same view. It's the Rondo Avenue area of St. Paul. So there was a, uh, you know, a clear and profound uh, exclusion and injustice here that we are living with today and that we need leadership on and that IBTTA and the tolling business are well positioned to be leaders on. 
Here's Indianapolis. You can see underneath the street grid of 1950, and you can see I-64 uh, and the route that was actually carried out, again, in the African-American part of Indianapolis. So the streets, just like Norton Juster said in the Phantom Toll Booth, became invisible to planners who only measured how fast people were driving. They didn't see other values. We had people who fought against this. Moselle Sanders of Indianapolis fought against it in a movement he called Homes Before Highways. Uh, we saw it, uh, this also in Harlem, where there were plans to put in a uh, arterial route right through the middle of Harlem. And this picture I chose because it shows that the street that was invisible to the traffic planners intent on moving vehicles as fast as possible had a lot that was going on in it. This is a 1939 view and you can see that the street and the sidewalk are places of business, of sociability, of play, of education. It's an all purpose thing and yet the values represented in this picture did not register at all in the calculations of the people who gave us our city planning of the 20th century. It meant that, for example, when Ronnie Riley lost his sidewalk to a widening project for the sake of cars and rode in the street as the policeman required, he ended up being killed by a truck, right? And I chose this one example to stand in for many others like it. In Harlem, there were protests against this. This is a 1963 movement led by George Gregory of the uh, New York City, um, uh, City Assembly. And he resisted this as well. So sidewalks have value, stoops have value, neighborhoods, communities have value as well. Uh, he was opposing the things instead of people attitude and favored wide sidewalks as playgrounds for the children of Harlem. This was captured, this problem was captured most vividly on television in 1963 in May when James Baldwin told his interviewer, urban renewal means moving Negroes out. It means Negro removal. This is a history that comes from the people who said that we should have toll-free driving everywhere. That in turn suggests to me the possibility that the people who can start to repair the damage that was done maybe the experts on those who actually stand for charging people for the cost of supplying them the road capacity that they use. Now, James Baldwin was using television, which was kind of a breakthrough. This was in New York City in 1963 because African-Americans were actually hardly ever seen on television. Television, in fact, was condemned by the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission in 1961 as a vast wasteland, a wasteland metaphorically similar to the wasteland that was visited upon African-American Detroit in the form of the Chrysler Freeway. Uh, FCC Chairman Newton Minow, who served for President Kennedy, called television a vast wasteland. And I think this comparison is useful because actually the television story improved in a way that I think we could still see, uh, where we could still see the improvement for um, road use and for and through tolling in particular, right? So African Americans were opposing the exclusion of people of color from programs, uh, from the stories as actors and as producers and as crew people, all the way back in 1955, when uh, NAACP and other groups organized a blackout. That is, people refused to watch television. Uh, to signify their opposition to this. This particular protest signals that this problem had, has a long history, but the response and ultimate mitigation of the most extreme forms of this problem are instructive lessons for all of us seeking to uh, contribute to a society of justice and fairness, right? Now, the National Association of Broadcasters formed in 1958 and issued a uh, television code to make sure that uh, member stations held up high standards of television, but they had nothing to say about the fact that practically every program had an all white cast with the occasional lone exception typically cast in a stereotypical role. 
Uh, now, Newton Minow, the new 1961 new chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, agreed that television was failing Americans. He was not very alert on the racial aspect of this, but he was alert on others. And in a very famous address, he condemned, on the, and you can see this is on the front page of the New York Times, he condemned television as a vast wasteland of triteness, of violence, of triviality, uh, of tedium. Um, and he, he urged uh, stations to do better. He reminded stations of something very important, that the airwaves belong to the people, and, theref and therefore it's up to the government to decide if the intended use of a given channel is good enough to serve the people who own the airwaves. Well, of course, the people own our roads and streets as well. Those are public property too. And I think there's an analogy to be made between Newton Minow's condemnation of a vast wasteland uh, on the airwaves and our own uses and misuses of public space in the form of some highways and parking and so on, right? So vast wasteland, he did not mince words. He had special advice about children's programming. He thought maybe television can be applied to teach uh, children and to help narrow achievement gaps between social groups and racial and ethnic groups as well. And he saw as a way to do it that he could open up far more channels. In 1961, there were only 12 channels available to people. That's when WUHF in New York City was launched. It opened up another 70 channels on televisions. And here's the front page story in the New York Times about this new experiment. UHF would open up far more channels. The trouble is almost nobody could receive them yet because their televisions could only receive the 12 VHF uh, channel frequencies. So uh, Newton, Newton Minow says, we're going to reform television by opening up a great many more channels. This will make it possible, for example, to have educational TV as well, right? So through government action, not through the, the American Broadcasting Association resisted this, the National Association of Broadcasters resisted this because of the expense of the, uh, the televisions uh, the capable of receiving uh, UHF, they resisted it. And so this was a government action. It wasn't a broadcaster's action. That's why if you're old enough to remember conventional TV, you probably remember seeing two knobs on the television, the, uh, the bottom knob in this case being the 12 VHF channels, the top being another 70 to 80 UHF channels as well. This opened things up. It's why suddenly there were new possibilities that really weren't practical before in television as well. Um, I want you all to consider if UHF was the biggest leap forward in television, what was a comparable leap forward in tolling? I'm going to uh, pause for um, about 10 seconds or so to give you a chance, if you like, to type something into the chat box about what you think is the analogous breakthrough in tolling uh, that's comparable in its significance to the introduction of UHF, which increased the number of channels available to people from a maximum of 12, most people actually had access to much fewer, to, to a maximum of about 80, right? So type that in if you like. Uh, the answers I think will be interesting and I think also important because if UHF could revolutionize broadcasting, then what you have typed in to the chat box may revolutionize tolling in similar ways. Now to Joan Gantz Cooney of a New York television station, UHF meant the possibility for something extraordinary. She typed up this proposal in 1967 uh, called The Potential of Television in Preschool Education, in which she first proposed what eventually became Sesame Street. But notice the era. It's an era a lot like ours with a population in a state of 
anger and turmoil and division over controversies like police killings. This woman held this sign up on the march from Selma to Montgomery. Here we see people marching in 1966 on the uh, James Meredith March Against Fear in Mississippi. James Meredith, the man who single-handedly as the lone black student at Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, integrated it in 1962, participated in this 1966 march and was actually shot and wounded. He survived. But this is an indication of the tensions in this country. And one response came from one of the marchers in the Meredith March, named originally was Stokely Carmichael, later changed it to Kwame Ture, and he started demanding black power. This slogan was as electrifying uh, in 1966 as Black Lives Matter is today and has been in recent years. Black power was, was um, a, a, a term, a demand as socially significant then as Black Lives Matter is now. And of course, black power is still with us as well as a term. You can see in the headlines of 1968, this is Greens, um, Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina, February 1968, the same kind of extreme anger and tension as there was, uh, as there is now, right? In Orangeburg, South Carolina in February 1968, these three men were killed because of a protest against them being uh, expelled from a, a segregated bowling alley. This was segregation after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when a segregation of public facilities was ruled unconstitutional. We saw also in 1968, of course, Martin Luther King was assassinated. These, I, I remind you of these things, which you, I think you already know mostly, because they resonate with 2020, don't you think? This is Black Power in 1968 at the Mexico City Olympics. The controversy over these two athletes raising their fists in, the, in a Black Power gesture is very much like the controversy we've been experiencing since 2016 over Colin Kaepernick uh, and his allies taking the knee. This is, in other words, an indication that we can learn from the 1968 experience because we're very much in it right now as well, right? So in a, in a um, commencement address at Williams College in Massachusetts, Whitney Young of the Urban League said some things that feel strangely current. Our history is founded on violence. We need to change the institutions, not just reform things uh, to bring about a future without poverty and racism. Now I'm, I want to s signal to you that this interest in wiping out poverty and ending racism, as ambitious as it sounds, especially in 1968, was exactly what Sesame Street set out to do, right? So after the Orangeburg massacre in South Carolina in 1968, protesters introduced another new slogan, which you can see on this sign, give a damn. That was a forgotten slogan of the era. It was picked up in uh, New York City. Joan Gans Cooney noticed it as well. In her, she decided she's gonna use television, uh, including its vices like jingles and television commercials and emulate those in her Sesame Street program. But she's also going to bring in the people demanding like Whitney Young was, like Stokely Carmichael was, a future of racial justice. And this is what, one of the reasons why Loretta Long was hired to be the first and now still so far only Susan on Sesame Street. She has served on Sesame Street for 51 years. And Susan and Matt Robinson gave this show a message, a message I started to pick up at the age of six when I tuned into the first episode of Sesame Street in November, 1969. Uh, the, the first Gordon, played by Matt Robinson, and the first Susan, and only Susan, played by Loretta Long, signaled to America that the days when television would not permit people to, of color to play roles such as these was over, and that the first audience for these people would be people who were at that time my age. Again, I was six on, on day one of Sesame Street, and I began to pick up the message 
a message that I needed desperately at that age, that uh, we could have a future without stereotypes, a future of inclusion. And Sesame Street helped make that happen. Now, you remember the give a damn slogan that originated after the Orangeburg massacre in South Carolina? This was current in New York City in that era, that is the late 60s. And one of the posters of the give a damn movement drew attention to conditions in uh, the neighborhoods of people of color in New York City. This shows Harlem. Now this had an influence on the set designer of Sesame Street who wanted to send a positive message about the fact that schooling education does not only occur in school buildings, it does not only occur in classrooms, and it does not only come from people we call teachers. Schooling, remember this shot of Harlem's front stoops in the 1930s? Well, the set designers of Sesame Street made a point. It's a point I don't think gets enough attention that streets, we're not talking about arterial routes for motor vehicles here. We're talking about streets, streets with wide sidewalks, streets that are safe for kids, are places where schooling happens, where education happens, where socialization happens, where educational play happens where fun happens, where storytelling happens, where learning happens, it all happens here. And Sesame Street vividly recreated that possibility. It's a possibility that has direct significance to our decisions about what streets and roads have been for. Uh, it's not the General Motors version of what streets and roads have been for, but it is a version that we can see value in and that I think uh, people in the tolling business can play a part in restoring. So just as television broadcasters, not willingly but ultimately reluctantly, came around to see that television could be educational, well, this vision shows us also that streets can be places for education as well. This was very much part of Loretta Long's own commitment. What people don't know about Loretta Long is that she had a background as a uh, activist committed to uh, full inclusion of African Americans in society. She was a co-host of this New York City television show called Soul with all black hosts and all black guests back in 1968. And it was there that she got her start in television. After she was hired by Sesame Street, she wrote a dissertation. Yes, Susan Loretta Long is a PhD her dissertation, which was approved in 1973, is called Sesame Street, A Space Age Approach to Education for Space Age Children. She said, we need technology, we need television, we need UHF, we need cable, we need new techniques, and we need social justice to be a part of it. And one of the most striking things to me in reviewing this dissertation is that Loretta Long says, Sesame Street has an explicit curriculum numbers and letters, right? Reuniting Digitopolis and Dictionopolis, so to speak. But she said it also has a non-explicit agenda that is an anti-racist agenda. Anti-racism is a, is a relatively new word that we've been hearing more of it. Well, she doesn't call it that, but it's all over this dissertation. She names institutional racism, racism comes up many times, and she says Sesame Street is a, effort to develop a future without racism. The very first book that she cites in her footnotes is Black Power by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton. You might remember Stokely Carmichael, later Kwame Touré, being the person who popularized this term back in 1966. And she's saying this is going to be a program of full inclusion uh, without compromise. Um, diversity, all races included, a white shopkeeper in the form of Mr. Hooper, uh, a, a, a white neighbor in the form of Bob, right? And also successful and happy people of color, Hispanics, uh, disabled people were all included in this program. I think one indication of the success of the program is that at first Mississippi banned it. Uh, that's a signal. That's a signal that it's, it's uh, anti-racist mission was 
noticed and significant. But at least as important, it was also profoundly a uh, success in terms of education. When children showed up for first grade in 1970, teachers found that their curriculum was no longer keeping up. That's why we see here in this headline from the Wall Street Journal that teachers were finding that they couldn't start off with the, just the ABCs in first grade anymore. What better tribute, and in the Wall Street Journal too, could there be for the educational success of Sesame Street, in particular with children uh, from, uh, from poorer backgrounds, um, this was narrowing the education gap. Now, I think all of this has something to tell us about what tolling can do, because you notice that Sesame Street is not just about uh, education. I think you could see in the, particularly in the set of the, of the program, a vision, a vision that says this is about uh, a healthy society, a healthy society of inclusion, a healthy society where people can uh, meet freely on steps, on sidewalks, in communities, on playgrounds, where not everyone, for example, has to buy a car to be included. Um, and I think this is a vision, incidentally, that uh, tolling has something to offer us. Uh, it, it can help us get to Sesame Street if we recognize that Sesame Street is not just an electronic schoolroom. It is a vision of an, a society of inclusion. It's a vision that the National Association of Broadcasters failed to contribute to and thereby missed the reputational benefits that would come with that. Uh, but I think it's not too late for the tolling business to get involved if it wishes to do so. Uh, with that, I'd like to, to end my uh, presentation and I wanna thank you all for your time and your attention and your interest. Peter, thank you uh, so much for that excellent presentation. And I think if you, uh, if you listen, can you hear me on your phone? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay so, so we have a lot of questions coming in, in. and uh, they have to do with uh, the dividing of African-American communities from the cities in which they participated. And uh, here's a question from Dr. Barbara Gannon, who's been a leader of our Leadership Academy. She says, thanks for the history of urban renewals, dividing of African-American and devastating those communities. I regret that my audio just failed me. Uh, okay, you, can you hear me now? Hear me now, now? I, now yeah. I hear you again, yeah. Okay, okay. thanks for thanks the history, for the history of, urban of urban renewal, renewal uh, dividing, uh, dividing of African-American African -American and, devastating and devastating those, those communities. communities. There was an there was effort, an effort in, cities, in cities, Rochester, Rochester New, York, New York, York, for one, to open, to open the roadways that divided city neighborhoods. This was during the Obama administration. Is that a success or was it too late to mend the damage? Okay, I'm not uh, well acquainted with the remedial efforts that have been going on in Rochester. I can speak to remedial efforts elsewhere and and just say that, you know, we, we should expect any improvement to be small compared to the devastation that was wrought. And nevertheless, you know, I would be the last person to criticize Sesame Street for contributing in only a small way. We need all of the help that we can, can get. I mean, Rochester, you know, if you look at a, a uh, Google satellite view of the middle of Rochester, it's still about it just just to guess something like 50% parking lots. Well, I mean, urban real estate is valuable. And we can commit it to much better purposes, especially with the shortage of affordable housing. So um, I'm, I, I will never call any effort too small to be worthwhile. We need small and big efforts. Peter, that's Peter, great. That's great. Uh, uh, we have, we another, have another question, question for you. For you. Uh, with, uh, with the requirements, the requirements to, now to now consider environmental, environmental justice, justice as part of any project, project, have you have seen you a seen shift from the past in how or where, where major, major projects, projects are planned, planned or constructed? Or constructed? 
Yeah, the answer is yes. And actually, I did not know that there was an environmental justice component in these applications. I'm, I'm pleased to hear it. Um, but I think we started to see a real shift going back in about to the era of Sesame Street. Um, as probably many of, of the in the audience know, it was about that time that the US Department of Transportation required that there be um, two hearings before any project. And what had happened before is there'd be one hearing and then people didn't know what was going on and then they wouldn't be happy. Well, and then um, you would find that uh, it, they'd say it's too late, we already had our hearing. So USDOT said you gotta have two hearings. And since that era, a lot of projects that were planned were actually permanently stopped. Um, so that's a, to me a, a signal that the word power, as, as charged as that word is, is the right word. People need to have the power to, um, to make sure they get heard. And when that happened, most, the most devastating projects that had not yet already been done were stopped. Peter, Peter towards, towards the, the end of your, end presentation, of your presentation, you talked, you talked about, about how Sesame, Sesame Street, Street uh, conveyed, conveyed the message, the message that streets can be places, places for education, for education and, and uh, in addition to TV, and that uh, Sesame Street had an explicit curriculum, and it also had a, a non-explicit curriculum that was around anti-racism. So the question from another listener is, how can the tolling industry be more inclusive of people in color and poor people? The first, the first thing I'd like to say to that is, I hope that the tolling experts will really think about that because I'm confident you will get better answers than I can get. That said, I do think there are, you know, as an outsider, I think there are things that are fairly feasible in the way that UHF made educational TV practical, uh, I think some of the electronic tolling that we've seen in recent decades, especially recent years, has made remedial action possible. By that I mean, um, you can have, uh, for, it, it could be a surcharge, a voluntary surcharge that people pay if they'd like to see the money go to community remediation of one kind or another. That could be to the local communities that were deserved, or it could be to local transit or bus stops or bike lanes or whatever you want. Now, I know that there are, of course, legal limitations to what can be done with a toll and that taking money from a driver and putting it to another mobility purpose is highly controversial and often illegal. But I disagree that that's diversion to me, it's not diversion because we don't know what the driver really wanted to do. If a driver, for example, when I drive, very often I would have preferred to ride my bike or to take a bus, but those options were not practical given the design of the road. And so I don't care to have any toll I might pay interpreted as only um, driving. And there's some precedent for this. Uh, you probably know that the Highway Trust Fund originally was committed only to road construction. And this was a, a sacrosanct principle. But then in 1973, uh, Congress uh, passed a law that permitted the trust fund to allocate some of its money to other mobility needs. Now we've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed the word mo mobility proliferate. I think if we understand what mobility really means, just like in the case of Sesame Street, if we understand what education really means, it doesn't just happen in the classroom. Mobility doesn't just happen in a motor vehicle. And if we really understand mobility, then I think that could really open up some possibilities. I mean, I'd like to see uh, the International Mobility Association someday coming out of this uh, and not just uh, a toll, uh, turnpike and bridge association. Peter, Peter, I want to thank, like thank you for being, being with us today, today and for challenging us, us for posing some, some tough questions, questions that we all we need to embrace and, uh, and, and live. live. This has been, been an outstanding presentation, presentation and I know, and I know you're going to get many more viewers in the aftermarket. aftermarket. Uh, just, uh, a just a couple of announcements, of announcements before, before we finish, finish up. First, the Toll Excellence Awards deadline is July 1st. 
as part of the six award categories, the judges encourage everyone to consider submitting projects that reflect efforts to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's no separate category. It's simply asking you and inviting you to submit projects related to COVID-19 in any of the other six categories. This could be your year to win. Remember, July 1 is the deadline. Second, next Tuesday, June 23rd at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, we've, we're having a webinar called Blockchain, Demystifying a Powerful Business Tool. And it features James Hoffman from the North Texas Tollway Authority, Matt Milligan of Milligan Partners, Deanna Bailey of GoCoin, Karen Otoni of Hyperledger, and Dan Smuller with the North Carolina Blockchain Initiative. I know I'm going to be there because I know nothing about this, and I'm really curious. Third, and finally, on July 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, we have the webinar Part 2, Bias. See it, say it, stop it. This features nationally recognized diversity expert Tracy Brown, who's already done a, a webinar for us a few weeks ago. Peter, thank you again. That's our wrap up for today. Thank you viewers. Be safe, keep in touch, and we'll see you down the road. Bye now.